Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we're going to begin talking about Chapter 13, which is about electrons in atoms. So I like to begin with a brief review of what we've learned so far. So remember, Democritus was the first one to mention that matter is made up of atoms. Nothing much happened until the late 1700s when Dalton uh, developed his atomic theory and he thought that atoms were solid and indivisible. And then J.J. Thompson discovered the electron with his cathode ray tube experiment. He also proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. And then um, Rutherford discovered the nucleus with the gold foil experiment, and he also discovered protons. And then Chadwick is credited with discovering the neutron. Millikan determined the charge and mass of the electron. And that leads us to Bohr's model. And Bohr proposed uh, something called the planetary model. He proposed that electrons have fixed energies and they have these energy levels that move out from the nucleus. Um, and they have to have this specific energy, um, which is why they don't fall into the nucleus. And again, his model is called the planetary model. And according to the Bohr model, the energy levels are like the rungs of a ladder. And again, electrons were thought to not exist in between the levels. They need this specific amount of energy to move from one level to another. And this is what the uh, Bohr model looked like, where you have a nucleus and then you have these energy levels. Um, and again, the electrons have to be at one of those. And you'll notice that the levels are equally spaced. And that leads us to section 13.1, which is the quantum mechanical model. So the current model of the atom is called the quantum mechanical model. And it is similar to Bohr's model with some key exceptions. Specifically, the energy levels are not equally spaced like the rungs of a ladder. They get closer the farther from the nucleus we, you go. And the higher the energy of the electron, the easier it is to leave an atom. So there's no exact path for an electron to take. What we talk about are areas of high probability to find an electron and areas with a low probability to find an electron. And again, the energy levels are not equally spaced from one another. And they get closer together as you move away from the nucleus. So here is a picture of what we're talking about with the quantum mechanical model. You still have your nucleus, in this case with a proton, one proton in it. And then you have your energy levels. And you'll see that as you move out from the nucleus, they're getting closer and closer together. And we call them by specific uh, level names. And we'll talk about that more in a second. So what we're talking about with the quantum mechanical model and the chief difference between it and Bohr is that we talk about probabilities of finding an electron and we represent that with something called a fuzzy cloud and the cloud shows where the electron is about 90 percent of the time. So we have very specific names and addresses uh, for locating an electron in space. We begin with the principal or main energy levels, and they're assigned numbers according to their energy, and the numbers are integers, n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and they go up to 7, where n is the lowest energy, the closest to the nucleus, and as you increase number, you're increasing energy and distance from the nucleus. And then each of those principal energy levels, and remember I said their level, uh, they're numbered 1 through 7, has one or more sublevels. And the number of sublevels is equal to the energy level's number. So at n equals 1, you have one sublevel, and it's called 1s. At n equals 2, there are two sublevels. They're called s and p. The third level has three sublevels S, P, and D, and the fourth level has four sublevels S, P, D, and F. And each sublevel 
has a specific number of orbitals. So the S sublevel only has one orbital. Each P sublevel has three orbitals. They're called X, Y, and Z. Each D sublevel has five orbitals, and they're called X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z, X squared minus Y squared, and Z squared. And each F sublevel has a total of seven orbitals, and I'm not going to get into their names right now. So right here, this is a chart that shows you there are seven possible energy levels, so that's principal level one through seven. Then I'm showing you the number of sublevels within that, and so n equals one has one sublevel, it's called s, and n equals two, you get two sublevels, the s and the p. At n equals three, there are three possible sublevels, s, p, and d, for SPDF and so on and so forth. So for now, I thought I would show you a visualization of what these orbitals look like. Okay, so this is an orbital simulator from the University of Kentucky, and I'm going to show you hydrogen-like orbitals. So first we'll do an S, and if I click it, I can set it in motion. And then I'm going to go back to the orbitals, and I'll show you what a P looks like. And actually, you can see here that there are three P orbitals. They're sort of dumbbell-shaped, and this is the X, Y, and Z. And then there are D orbitals. So remember I said S, there's only one orbital. P, there are three equal orbitals. D, there are one, two, three, four, five, five orbitals. Um, and then there are F and G, and they're like really crazy. So they go up as odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine. So the F orbitals are even crazier still. And then here's the G's. Now for our purposes, we're really only going to be con concerned with the S orbitals the P orbitals, and the D orbitals. And again, what we're seeing here in these pretty colors is the probability of finding an electron in space. So if we go back to S, the probability of finding an electron is about 90% of the time it's in this region. With the P's, it's 90% of the time in these regions that are colored. So outside of it, then you have less than a 10% chance of finding an orbital. So for now, this is Ms. Augustine, and I'm going to sign off.